Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for the digital CFC kickoff for the Department of Commerce's CFC campaign. I'm thrilled that you've been able to join us to learn more about the CFC this year. My name is Mark Seiler, and I am this year's CFC manager for the Department of Commerce. In my day job, I'm the chief financial officer for NOAA. For those of you that are new to the Department of Commerce or new to the CFC, I'll explain a little bit about it. CFC stands for the Combined Federal Campaign, and it is the federal government's premier workforce giving program. The mission of the CFC is to promote and support philanthropy through a program that is employee focused, cost efficient, and effective in providing all federal employees the opportunity to improve the quality of life for all. The CFC's history starts in 1956, when then President Dwight Eisenhower formally implemented a program for fundraising within the federal service. It was then expanded under President John F. Kennedy in 1964 to be a combined campaign for all of the federal government, and it grew tremendously from raising 12.9 million back in 1964 to over 80 million in 1979. Today, through the CFC, the federal workforce joins together annually to show some love for our communities and the many charity, charitable organizations that support them. Each, asso each associated charity is vetted by the CFC team at the Office of Personnel Management, so you can rest assured that your support is going to make a difference for the people and causes you care about. I volunteered to lead the CFC this year, in part, because philanthropy is incredibly important to me, my family, and my community. My family, we currently volunteer at an organization that uh, helps uh, people in need if they're coming from out of the area or trying to escape domestic violence or some other type of a thing that uh, helps get them set up in an apartment and furnishes it. Um, additionally, you never know, you never know when you're going to need um, uh, assistance. And this happened to me. My mother was, um, uh, she was aging gracefully and needed to go into assisted living. However, she couldn't afford the dr dramatic prices that that assisted living costs. And uh, lucky for me, and I'll ever, forever be indebted to the organization that was able to step in to provide a safe place for my mom to age gracefully in assisted living. So this year's, the CFC is very different from previous years. Due to the pandemic, many of us are working re remotely. So we don't have the same opportunities to coordinate in-person events as we would have done in the past. Instead, we'll be working to provide digital events like this one that can help spread the message about the CFC, encourage participa participation, and promote education and awareness. All of our lives have been changed by this unprecedented moment in our collective history. And that goes for many of the charitable organizations represented by the CFC as well. In the face of this pandemic, we have all been asked to band together. One of the many ways we can do that is by becoming involved in this year's CFC. Today, we'll hear a special message from the department about the importance of the CFC and its relation to the Department of Commerce. Then we'll have a presentation about the history of philanthropy from Dr. Kathy Batacher from the Indiana University's Lilly School of Philanthropy. Now a word from the department. Welcome to the Department of Commerce kickoff for the 2020 Combined Federal Campaign. It is a great privilege and honor for me to usher in this year's CFC a federal giving tradition of over 60 years. It brings me joy to envision how we will again make a substantial difference in countless lives through our participation in this campaign. President Eisenhower founded the CFC in 1958. The Red Cross and several similar groups that operated on a local level were among the first to receive support from this unique and noble effort. Eleven presidential administrations later, the program has grown to hundreds of millions of dollars for over 6,000 charities each year. These charities are vetted 
by the Office of Personnel Management and represent causes ranging from veterans affairs and education to medical research and services for our nation's homeless. Historically, Department of Commerce has been responsible for one of the largest contributions to the CFC, and I'm sure we will continue that legacy. In 2019, 2,804 Commerce employees contributed over $2.4 million of the roughly $86 million raised by the CFC in total. I'm immensely proud of last year's achievements. As Americans, we care about one another. Our country has weathered many strong storms thanks to the perseverance of its people and to our willingness to help our neighbors and community neighbors when they need it. We have all had to rely on our networks during this most unusual year. And for some, this includes interacting with one of the thousands of charities that rely on the CFC. The coronavirus pandemic also eliminates our traditional fundraising events, such as bake sales, in-person charity fairs, and similar events. However, while the circumstances and methods of the 2020 campaign are unique, you will find our theme quite familiar. We shall continue the, quote, show some love, end quote, theme that served us so well in 2019, with an added call to be the face of change. This call provides a concrete opportunity for each of us to accomplish the often nebulous goal of creating change and supporting causes that promote the greater good. <clears throat> now I would like us all to take a moment and reflect on our own reasons for giving through the CFC. Is it to honor someone you know? Do you feel passionate about giving your time in support of a special cause? <clears throat> Do you find value in continuing this long-running tradition? Just as we all had our own reasons for dedicating our lives to public service in support of fellow Americans, we all have our own reasons for giving through the CFC. There are many ways to make your contribution to this program, via credit card, via e-check, payroll deduction, or by deducting a portion of your time to a volunteering opportunity. This year, there will also be a CFC mobile app. I understand that not all of us are in a position to donate, and as the coronavirus pandemic has had an unequivocally negative impact on the economy and on many of us here today. However, I am optimistic that the economic outlook for our nation and all its citizens is already improving. Just last week, we learned that real GDP rose by a record 33.1% in the third quarter. Consumers are leading the way in this recovery. They spent $2 trillion more in August than in April, yet they accumulated $22 trillion in savings between March and September. Much of this strong economic rebound is due to President Donald Trump's CARES Act and the continued work of this administration as a whole. We have cause for great optimism in the near future. And for those who would like to contribute to the CFC, but lack the financial resources to make a donation at this time, please 
become a CFC ambassador, volunteering your time or reaching out to your friends and colleagues to speak with them about contributing to this important cause. If you're still not sure whether the CFC is for you, I encourage you to visit the website, givecfc.org. That's givecfc.org. Or ask your key worker for more information. I hope you will join this wonderful community of caring. The CFC inspires me as it starts with countless acts of individual generosity and sows the seeds of charity and prosperity across our nation. And all of you have also inspired me. I thank you for your contributions to this nation, both in and outside the office, as you support others through your professional responsibilities and your participation in the combined federal campaign. Now, let's turn to the history and legacy of philanthropy in the U.S. from Dr. Bradishir. Dr. Kathy Bradishir, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me today. On behalf of myself and our audience of the Department of Commerce, we are incredibly appreciative of your time and sharing your experience on the topic of philanthropy and its history. To start, I was hoping you could tell us a bit about your work at Indiana University's Lilly School of Philanthropy. How did your career lead you there and how do you define philanthropy? Mark and everyone at uh, the Department of Commerce, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, it's really, especially in such a challenging year, a pleasure to get to talk about something as uplifting as generosity and philanthropy and thinking about something besides yourself. So it's really an honor. Um, my career has been quite non-traditional to get to um, a, a position at the Lilly Family School. I actually had a long corporate career, which was great for a long time. Um, and then I realized something was something was missing. And um, I think like a lot of people, I turned to volunteering in the community to fill a gap, I think. And um, long, very long story short, I ended up stumbling into what used to be the Center on Philanthropy thinking, I'm going to take a class and I'll be a more informed board member, a more intentional volunteer. And I was so fascinated by the people I got to meet and the things that I had to think about and read about that um, it ended up being a whole career change. So um, I've studied the history of philanthropy in particular. Um, and we know that generosity, the inclination to take care of each other is an ancient phenomenon and that every faith tradition in some way teaches that we should help each other. So um, the definition of philanthropy is kind of a slippery thing. It's what it means to you, really. Our school teaches that philanthropy is voluntary action intended for the public good. And there's a lot happening in that phrase, right? Uh, voluntary, something you choose to do. Uh, action, not just thinking something good, that you should do for somebody else, but actually carrying out some action and then intended for the public good, which could be contested. Your idea of public good might not be exactly the same as mine. Um, so there's room for making it your own, what it means to you. Um, I think what we give encompasses not only, we think of giving of money, um, and sometimes when I say I teach at the Lilly Family School of Philanthropy, I get quizzical looks like, mm, so you raise money, you give away money, you must be rich. Um, but when I say we investigate theories of giving and volunteering, everybody has something that they can relate to in that. Um, everyone has donated, helped somebody, volunteered, um, and including volunteering their voice advocacy, which is an important part of, of how we understand philanthropy. 
So what are the roots of philanthropy here in the US? And what were some of the earliest philanthropic efforts or organizations in the US and what role did they play in communities? Mm -hmm. So we know, of course, Native Americans, um, indigenous people had philanthropic traditions. Um, sadly, we don't know as much as we wish we could because so much of um, indigenous traditions are passed down orally. So there's still research being done to, um, to investigate that. Um, we know that from um, the English people who came early, um, that they brought a really strong notion of community with them that they inherited from Great Britain. And really that's the underpinning of philanthropy in the US today. Um, and there are some famous speeches and sermons that are really milestones in our understanding of US philanthropy. Um, so the, the notion of community responsibility and taking care of your neighbor, even checking on your neighbor um, and making sure everybody's okay. You know, when you think of tiny embryonic communities where everybody knew everybody um, and this, this neighborhood benevolence um, really has informed how we've evolved as a country. We also know that women uh, played a much larger role than when you might tend to think um, based on your your understanding of American history. Um, and a lot of work has been done in the last generation or so on on unearthing women's agency. So um, you know everybody knows Benjamin Franklin and um, many, 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 philanthropic organizations that he founded um, or, or contributed to founding. Um, and what we know less about are, are organizations like um, the earliest women's organization we know of from 1797, the Society for the Relief of Poor Widows in New York, uh, founded by Isabella Graham. And she there'll be a book coming out in a couple of years um, that uh, I understand is, is being researched now. Um, she brought this notion of caring for women and children. And uh, th these would have been well-to-do women who, who were in the same church and social circles, um, who then organized uh, a benevolent association as a natural extension of their caring for households and caring for the community. Um, I asked my students, um, in history to look at the early sermons and um, Franklin's letters and things like that um, and, and pick out what were considered public purposes and go back to our understanding of voluntary action intended for the public good. Um, and what we see are many, many, many public services, public um, purposes and services that government carries out today were fulfilled by voluntary associations, particularly in colonial America and the early 19th century. And uh, it makes a lot of sense when you stop and ponder that because we were founded on the um, understanding that government should be small and that the federal government in particular uh, should be small and people were were rebelling against the power of the crown and a state church and a lot of control. And so things like street paving and street cleaning, fire protection and a militia, all of these were voluntary associations controlled locally, manned locally, uh, funded locally, but and all voluntarily. And so um, what continues to be um, interesting to me and, and very much alive in the U.S. is this idea of incubating um, public purposes and um, services and, and deciding what's important to us um, in the philanthropic space. And then um, only government can take those to scale. So it's interesting that how far back the philanthropic um, sector goes. Um, well, you touched on a few of the major milestones, but um, in order to bring it to a wider audience and into the mainstream, 
how how has that evolved, and what are the some of the key historical moments uh, mm -hmm. moments or movements in which phil philanthropy played a larger role? Yep, absolutely. So um, I had a few favorite stories, which um, I'm sure you do too, as you um, think about um, our own past. Uh, one is since you're you're sitting right there um, in Maryland in DC is the Smithsonian, um, and the Smithsonian has a a very quizzical origin story um, that started with a bequest. So bequest giving, um, estate giving, um, is a tradition that um, settlers brought from England as well. Um, so this is a uh, hundreds of years old idea that uh, for charitable purposes, that um, a person of any sort of means may choose to make a gift, um, leave that in their estate, and then it's for someone else to carry out. So James Smithson did just that. And what's odd, and we'll never know, we, we just know what he wrote, which was practically nothing, um, he never set foot in the United States, first of all. Um, he's a British chemist, and he amassed some wealth, and he left his bequest in 1829. And he said if his sole heir, who was his nephew, did not have children of his own, then he left a, a massive amount of money at the time uh, for, quote, the increase and diffusion of knowledge, end quote. Well, for the increase in diffusion of knowledge, that's up to interpretation, right? There's no precedent for that. So uh, his nephew died without heirs. So the money came to the US Congress. Of course, they deposit the check, right? Of course. And then debated for 10 years, what do we do? And so suggestions came in from all corners of the country. And finally, 17 years later, 1846, established the first of the Smithsonian. So ever that, since, yeah, that's been a public-private partnership. That's how the Smithsonian, all those that's, museums started. Right. The mysterious bequest for the in, increase in diffusion of knowledge. So apparently Smithson felt that we had some work to do here um, to learn, but uh, that that's the origin. So that's an interesting milestone because it was such a test of what do we think public purpose is, right? Yeah. And Congress had to agree. Um, so the um, the purview of the, the federal government has been tested over many years. And um, Franklin Pierce as president, who um, did not have a particularly stellar or um, memorable career as president wrote a really important, uh, really legal brief that vetoed a move when um, land grants were going on. Um, and a reformer petitioned for 10,000 acres, I think, for um, a, a public space and a public institution to house the mentally ill. And Pierce wrote, he vetoed this, so that didn't happen. Um, states formed institutions instead, um, which has had its own history. But he wrote at the time that the federal government should not be the great almoner of public charity. And, and in the annals of US history of philanthropy, this was um, not a turning point, but an important milestone because it set boundaries. And again, it reinforced this notion of community responsibility. He wasn't saying that people shouldn't take care of each other, but what he was saying was this belongs locally, identified, controlled, managed, funded, because people close to each other know how to take care of each other. So only a few years later, we have the Civil War. And no, there was no infrastructure in the country um, medically or or otherwise um, that could have prepared us for what we went through. And um, so this notion of what should the federal government do to take care of soldiers, 
the home front um, was severely tested. And so um, again, I go back to a very interesting woman, Louisa Scarler in New York, uh, started a, an aid association in New York City, went to her minister because she knew she needed a, a prominent man to support her cause, Henry Bellows, an important minister in New York City. And she said, this should really be a national function. And so so he went to President Lincoln then in, in 1861. So this is only nine years after Pierce said the federal government you know, really needs to um, remain at arm's length. And Bellow said, this needs to be a national function. And, and Lincoln thought about it and said, this sounds like a fifth wheel. He used that expression. So you can do something nationally only if it's disbanded quickly after the war, because he realized that we, we were in trouble. Um, we had hundreds of thousands of men killed, wounded, taken prisoner. Um, the medical department was tiny. And so um, we formed on the, in the Northern states, the US Sanitary Commission. In the South, states formed sanitary commissions to carry out this work. Um, and this is a real sea change in philanthropy because um, the, the commission staffed up, they even raised money professionally. Um, this is sort of the beginning of professional fundraising as we think of that as an apparatus of charity today. Um, and they carried out so much innovation, they saved hundreds of thousands of lives. And so this is how we get public health departments. There's some um, understanding, you may read that we get the Red Cross from the Sanitary Commission and actually that's a, that's a different initiative. Um, but things like um, nurses formal training and dog tags on soldiers and ambulances and many things in um, the medical landscape, again, that we take for granted and that only government really can take to scale came out of this um, this fascinating period of time of change. So I can keep going um, with interesting stories, but um, it, you may have it, a question. Yeah, it's fascinating that, you know, all the nonprofits of today started, you know, before the Civil War. And then many of the government functions actually started as nonprofits, as, as you said. Yeah, exactly. Um, how, how did the, the modern day um, nonprofits. Um, how did it evolve from what it was back then, something that seemed to be temporary, and into where, where we are today, to where, and how the government interacts with uh, modern uh, nonprofits? Right. So, government and philanthropy have always been intertwined. Um, and since you can see me, uh, I mean, they're they're like this, and it's a it's a complicated relationship because they need each other, right? If you think of the sectors of society, the nonprofit sector, government sector, and of course, business. Um, so there's been a bit of a, a push and pull and that had, like everything else, um, waxes and wanes over time. Um, so we get a, a, an enabling regulatory framework from England. So the early settlers brought this notion of, um, believe it or not, a regulatory framework of charity from um, 1601, an important date in England. And I asked my students, history is not memorizing a bunch of dates, but give me 1601. And they look at me like, what could that possibly have to do with, um, with philanthropy today? But it's still relevant because the Queen passed a series of poor laws and in the 1601 uh, statute, the Queen spelled out public purposes and many of those are like I was talking to you about street paving and care of soldiers and libraries and all these things are specifically listed. Um, and lots of sectors, if you will, uh, subsectors are mixed, like education. Government systems certainly provide education, so does the nonprofit sector, and healthcare, and so on and so on and so on. And then there are lots of these like joint ventures like the Smithsonian. Um, we didn't have tax laws, um, income tax law um, in particular, until 1913. 
And um, this is an important feature of the nonprofit sector because this is the main way that um, the government regulates nonprofits is through the tax code. So states, attorneys generals, um, charter and, and regulate nonprofits, but at the federal level through tax policy, we, we regulate nonprofits and particularly um, with foundations and grant making organizations that have a lot of, of power and influence, especially the larger ones. So, um, so governments, government needs nonprofits to carry out a, a lot of important functions, um, but government also has to monitor the effectiveness and the you know, compliance of the sector. And so there have been historical moments in which government has really challenged, um, like in the 1960s, the, um, your listeners might know that foundations are required by law, by the tax code, to pay out in grants at least 5% every year, 5% of their um, earnings. And so um, before 1969 and that ruling, um, you could form a private or a corporate foundation and um, and sit on the money. And so there were um, accusations of hoarding and dodging policy and not acting in public interest through this um, shield of a nonprofit organization. And, um, and that pressure on um, nonprofits really ramped up to the point that the law changed. And so it really changed um, nonprofit behavior for the good um, because it's, um, money shouldn't be simply walled off and not put to public purpose. So um, another, I think, important defining characteristic that um, I, I don't wanna forget about is the separation of religion from government. And that was an, an important part of our history. And again, that um, goes back to the reasons for forming the country was um, one of the reasons to, to get away from the state church and the Church of England and the crown being so, so interlocked. Um, and so it took a little while, but this disestablishment of religion from government um, has had a um, profound effect on um, the philanthropic sector and, um, and also government support. So it allowed for a proliferation of congregations and um, types of religion, but that also um, allows for a lot of services to be provided like healthcare and education and social services, um, which takes some pressure off government to try to serve all those different roles. Um, and it again also allows for experimentation and innovation, and then you know government steps in because only government has the power to tax, to take something to scale, to legislate um, based on what is appropriate for the majority of citizens. So. Interesting that um, you know, as I watch The Crown on, on Netflix, some of those things <laughs> are, I'm actually seeing. Um, so. <laughs> It's like neither the, the where the regulations came from, nor I mean the, the history never um, they never thought of a digital age or digital era that we're in. And there's a there's huge I mean we've seen the ice bucket challenge as an example right. that is seemingly changing. We're in the middle of a pandemic, and we're able to have this discussion digitally um, right. uh, from, from from our own homes. And um, so where do you see philanthropy going in the coming years with the proliferation of new technologies and increased communications? Mm -hmm. it, again, um, we're right in the middle of seeing change happen. Um, technology, of course, like everything else, um, blessing and bane, perhaps. Um, and so we know that online giving has been um, growing rapidly with Giving Tuesday and Text to Give and, and um, lots of different tools. Uh, just last year's Giving Tuesday, um, if, if you haven't come across Giving Tuesday, you won't be able to hide much longer. Um, it's, <laughs> it's a deluge. If you're on any, um, 
any charity mailing list, you'll you'll hear about it. Well, it's it's a fairly new event. Um, the Tuesday after Thanksgiving uh, last year, Giving Tuesday in the aggregate raised over five hundred million dollars, so half a billion dollars. It's only projected to continue to rise. What we don't know is how much Giving Tuesday types of gifts, um, crowdfunding, um, the, these immediate text gives, um, GoFundMe's, all of those. What we don't know is how much that those techniques are bringing in new gifts and how much they're, if you will, cannibalizing existing donor bases. So that's something that our school's research department is following closely. Um, certainly technology gives us access to information like never before, including information on charities and causes that you care about. And I think that that's a great plus because um, nonprofits like every other um, sector have to work really hard to convey their mission, convey their effectiveness, and to be transparent in how well they're working. And so there are more and more ways that if you're curious about something that you can get a lot of information quite readily from your phone um, about how many people are served, um, is the charity breaking even, um, and, and then do something about it and, and follow your cause. So there are so many crowdfunding platforms that, and I don't know them all, um, so I imagine these will these will have to start to filter out and the strong will survive. But uh, you can raise money on Facebook. Um, I mentioned GoFundMe. There's something called Mobile Cause, Fundly, Bonfire, Snowball, and Donate Kindly. I mean, then those are just new this year. So pick one you like. Um, and uh, for, for your listeners, I think, um, People still want relationships with their organizations. People donate because they care about something. And um, individual giving is by far 80% of individual giving, of total giving in our country. So um, as much as foundations, you know, big corporations do give to philanthropy, individuals are what makes the difference. And so, um, for people looking for a way to learn more about a cause, a charity, it's easier than ever. Um, in, in our introductory class at all degree levels um, at our school, we ask students to write a philanthropic autobiography and um, sort of your own mission statement about how you've gotten interested in participating in the community and what you care about. And so um, I've sort of told you mine, you know, I was in business, something was missing, I took a class. Um, there's lots more details for uh, someday when we meet in person. Um, but finding what you care about is, is part of your philanthropic autobiography. And so since we're all at home, uh, why not use technology to to investigate um, and learn. And um, Booker T. Washington said, uh, in, he, in Up From Slavery, uh, and I assigned this chapter uh, in one of my classes when he was raising money for Tuskegee, we should all lose ourselves in a great cause. And, um, and I love that, lose yourself in a great cause. Find something that speaks to you um, use your time and use technology to your advantage. Um, and then your reward is feeling like you're part of something bigger than yourself, which throughout our history, um, people have been searching for a way to be part of something bigger than themselves. Yes, thank you. Um, I, I see that directly. The, the CFC is even going mobile this year. So I think people have is. the ability to, for the combined federal campaign to right. go in to actually research instead of, you know, picking your favorite animal. I remember in the CFC, 
20 years ago that that's uh, I went through it and I'm like all right that's what I want to give to and then that that's what I donated to now there's so many more charities and the the information is there and you're right to be able to go in and then and learn about it and find out what mm -hmm. what's impactful for you so um, it's been great speaking with you today Dr. Bodicher. Um, you've shared some incredible context and knowledge, especially the historical aspects of it. I, f I find it fascinating how we've, we've come to where we are with the advancements of technology and everything else, but it's, it's the same um, uh, at, at, from where it started. Uh, modern day philanthropy, it's grown and evolved from its early iterations, but it's heartening to know how long it's been a tradition and a shared cultural value here in the US and even abroad. So um, philanthropy looks different to all of us. From For some, it's advocating for a cause or spreading awareness. For others, it's donating to those in need or volunteering. But no matter how it looks, the key, uh, like Dr. Bodicheer has, has uh, imparted on us, is finding what motivates you and what you are most passionate about. The CFC has some great opportunities for you, you to learn about the incre incredible groups in our communities that we can support. And I encourage all of you to go to cfcgiving.opm.gov and learn more about how you can get involved in this year's campaign. So now we're gonna have a short demo of the CFC site that will show you how to register as a new user, log in as a returning user, and browse the CFC charity catalog. All right. Now we'll overview the CFC Pledge online system. You can reach the system by going to https colon slash slash givecfc.org or by going to opm.gov slash show some love CFC. We'll be overviewing how to get started as a new user, as a returning user, and then how to make a pledge and manage your account. As a new user, it's pretty intuitive how to get onto the CFC. You'll start by signing up. When you go to the CFC website we overviewed just a second ago, you'll have an option to sign up now. Go ahead and click it. Once you're here, you'll have an option to create a new account. New users will need to provide their email and select a password with at least eight characters, including one uppercase, one lowercase, one number, and one special character. Once you've created your account, you'll receive an activation pin and link via the email that you provided. Once you've received this information, you can use it to finish setting up your account. Please note that the verification pin will only be valid for 48 hours. So it's best to do this all in one fell swoop. Next, you'll be asked to provide security questions and answers. These security questions will help you access your account in the case that you forget your password. Finally, you'll be asked to create your profile. This is what the profile page looks like. On it, you'll see you have an option to select items including your first and last name, where your primary work zip code is, your department, and more. Entering your personal information. From your personal information dashboard, you'll choose your donor type from the drop-down box. Then you'll enter your first and last name. Then you'll enter your work zip code. Remember, it's important that you choose the zip code in which your office is physically located, even though many of us are not currently working there. Do not use your personal zip code. If you're stationed outside of the US, you can click the checkbox that you are located in a non-US or foreign territory without a zip code. Finally, select whether you are an active duty or civilian employee. Next, you'll select the agency, office, and unit under which you work. You must select the correct department, agency, and office in order to receive credit for your donation. You can do this by using the drop-down selectors. First, you'll select your department, then you'll select your office after you've selected your agency. Or there is an option if you know your six-digit CFC code 
you can look it up directly and it will automatically populate this information. To get your six digit CFC code, feel free to reach out to your department's CFC coordinator. Okay, now we're going to review getting started as a returning user. If you've used the CFC before or made a, do a donation or a pledge before, chances are you're already registered. However, as is the case, sometimes we forget our passwords. So we're going to overview how to get back into your account in that case. If you know your email and your password, feel free to just enter them and sign in. However, if you need troubleshooting help, you can always select forgot email or forgot password and work through the menu to find out that information and have it sent to you. If you're still having difficulty, you can always hit contact us and there will be additional support. When you first logged into your profile, it's important to review, and make sure that everything is correct and that there have been no changes since last year. In particular, if you are working in a new office or you have transferred agencies, it's important to make sure that all of this information is still current and correct. As with our new users, you too will need to select your department, agency, and office. In order for your pledge to be processed, it's important that this information is correct and up to date. You can do this using the drop down menus. Offices in the zone that is selected via your entry of a primary uh, zip code will enable those offices to show up in the drop down menus. Work through the drop down menus to select the relevant department, agency, and office. Or if you know your six digit CFC code, you can look that up and all of these selections will be automatically populated for you. Once you've made all of these edits and updates, it's important that you click save changes. However, if you have not made any updates and all of your profile settings are correct as they stand, feel free to select the option that says there are no changes to my profile settings. You'll see a dialog box that'll pop open that says, confirm your changes if you've saved changes. You'll want to select continue. If the changes were made in error, however, you can hit cancel. Now, moving on to pledging. If you're already in the CFC system and have made a pledge in the past, it's very easy to copy your existing pledge. After updating and saving your profile, you'll land on a page where you'll be able to submit a new pledge or reload a pledge from a previous year. If you would like to reload a pledge from a previous year, simply click Copy Existing Pledge. Then you'll navigate to a page that shows you all of the pledges you've made in the past. You can select the existing pledge you wish to reload using the drop down options. Once you've selected it, you can simply click Copy Pledge. You'll be asked to confirm your choice to copy your pledge by, cl by clicking Continue with Copy. If you'd like to create a new pledge, simply select Submit New Pledge on the landing page. If you're creating a new pledge, it's very easy to find a charity that you might be interested in supporting. First, you can always search by a charity's name, CFC number, EIN number, or other keywords, if you know that information already. Additionally, you can browse charities by looking through the location. You can select the city, state, or zip code. If you're not sure what type of organization you want to support, it's easy to browse by categories. You can select a category like education, healthcare, or public safety. This will show you a list of all of the CFC charities that are supporting work in those areas. You can also search based on the zone that you're in. For example, if you work in the Hawaii Pacific region, you could simply select that zone 
and you'll only be looking at CFC charities in that zone. Additional information includes category, cause, administrative fundraising rate, and volunteer opportunities. The AFR is the percentage of the funding that goes directly to the service and work. This is a good number to be aware of because it shows you how much of your donation really goes to support the work that you're hoping to engage with. For volunteer opportunities, the CFC now allows donors to choose organizations that accept volunteers. Note that this option is only available for federal employees. If you select to volunteer for an organization, the number of hours that you volunteer will be counted towards your organization's total donations as they are entered as a dollar value based on the number of hours that you are volunteering. Once you've sorted and looked at the list of charities, you can add them by clicking the Add button next to the charity as it is listed. You'll, see, you'll receive confirmation that the charity you've chosen has been added to your pledge. When you're finished, click Checkout. Now we'll cover the donation portion of your pledge. Once you've pledged, you will see that there is an option to follow up on the actual pledge and make the donation. You can select different pledge methods. You will not see payroll as a pledge method if you have uh, already submitted a payroll pledge for the current campaign. You can submit additional credit uh, and debit, bank account, or volunteer pledges. However, you can only have one active payroll pledge. You can choose your payment frequency, whether it's a one-time gift or annually or monthly. Then you'll select your pledge amount. Once you've selected the amount, you can choose to distribute it to any number of different charities that you've selected. If you want to share your information with the charity that you have pledged to, just click this box. Oftentimes, charities will want to reach out to you after you've supported them with thank you messages or other updates on what their organization is doing and how they are working to service the specific area that you have supported. Once you've completed all of these fields, click continue with your pledge. If you check the box to share your information with your charity, you'll be asked to provide that information next. If you pledged volunteer hours, the only way the charity will be able to contact you about those volunteer opportunities is if you share your information. So be sure to click this option if you're pledging volunteer hours. If not, and if you don't feel comfortable sharing your information at this time, you can still follow up independently and reach out to the charity on your own to share your information. After you've completed all of these steps, you'll need to review, confirm, and submit your pledge. You'll see the screen will display the charity or charities that your pledge is being set up for, the distribution of the amount that you are pledging, and any relevant volunteer information. You'll also see the pledge method, the frequency, and the total amount. Once you've reviewed all of this, click the box that says I confirm and then submit your pledge. If you discover an error, you can navigate backwards by using the back key to return to the previous screen. Once you've confirmed your pledge, you'll see that a thank you has been generated. You'll see the pledge amount and all of the relevant information we've previously covered. If you need to, you can always print your pledge confirmation for a receipt that you can use later if you itemize your taxes. Finally, let's cover managing your account. 
In your account page on the CFC website, you'll find opportunities to manage your pledges, view transactions, get tax receipts, and update your profile and payment settings, all from the landing page. Thank you so much for listening to this presentation about the CFC. Feel free to contact CFC Customer Care at any time if you have additional questions. You can reach them at 1-800-797-0098 or 1-608-237-4898. I hope that demo helps as you start navigating the CFC. Thanks again to Dr. Bodicher for her time and thank you for all, for watching and participating. Be on the lookout for more information from your bureaus on CFC events in the coming weeks. We're also going to be hosting another department-wide event in November that will showcase some of the great organizations that the CFC supports. Until next time, thanks for watching and stay safe.